Welcome to Glory Stories with Dr. Elizabeth Vaughn. Dr. Vaughn was one of the top eye surgeons in America and has traveled to many countries in the world preaching the Word of God. She also opened up an eye surgery center in Beijing, China, where she did free eye surgery on those in need. Dr. Vaughn will be sharing many of her personal experiences from God. In addition, you will hear of others that have known God in an intimate way and seen His miracle working power. As you hear about how God has worked in the lives of others, our hope is that you will be changed forever. Get ready for God to heal you, deliver you, and transform your life as you sit back and enjoy these glory stories. Welcome to Glory Stories. We're going to talk today about a woman named Nora Lamb, a Chinese woman who was used mightily of God. I knew this woman personally, and she was really a character. And I'm going to tell you what the beginning of her life was more like. When she was 17 years old, she was caught by the Cultural Revolution in China. And this was a time when, as she describes it, a bloodbath was taken on in the nation. And people that were intellectuals or Christians were severely persecuted and most of the time killed. And this was a time when, when she was 17 years old. She was a very bright woman. Actually, she's a pretty aggressive woman, too. She went on to law school. She graduated top in her class in law school and was appointed to be one of the associate professors that taught the young soldiers accelerated classes. So the Cultural Revolution didn't touch her right away, but soon it came her way to the area where she, because they were going after school teachers, professors, and, and she was a professor. And so they singled her out and started interrogating her and, and asking her, are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? And if she didn't answer quickly enough to suit them, they would slap her, slap her in the face. And when they tried to get information about her friends or her family, and she didn't want to give them information, they would kick her with their boots. She found out that she had confided in one of her friends there that was a fellow professor. She had confided that her family was a Christian family. And they, being communist members, told the communists, and that's why they singled Nora out. That's why they were demanding that she answer, are you a Christian? And they would scream at her for hours and interrogate her for hours and wouldn't let her have any water, any food, any rest. They just continued. If they got tired, they'd send that shift out and a new shift in and make her stand there and continue interrogating her. So it was a time when she started searching in her own soul and trying to answer the question for herself, am I really a Christian? Because Nora knew that if she said she was a Christian, the likelihood would be that they would take her out and kill her, which she didn't want to die. She was a young woman. But on the other hand, she didn't want to deny Christ either. So she, she was thinking in her mind and thinking back to the time when she was a young girl and she went down the altar to the altar and accepted Jesus as her Savior. She remembered singing songs as a child, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, and lots of children's songs about Jesus. And she decided that really in her heart, she was a Christian. And so she asked the Lord, this is while they're still interrogating her, in her mind, these are the things she's thinking. She asked the Lord to forgive her for being kind of, you know, lukewarm, for not studying the Bible like she should, for not praying like she should have. She asked him to forgive her of all the shortcomings and the things that she'd done wrong and give her a brand new clean slate. And, of course, God's always happy to do that. When anybody asks forgiveness, he's happy to give them forgiveness. So when she, when she felt like she had gotten a clean slate from Jesus and gotten forgiveness from him, then a real peace fell into her heart, even though she was still being interrogated and still having pain inflicted on her. She at least had a peace in her heart. So she decided in her, her usual bold manner, when they shouted and screamed at her again, are you a Christian? She says, yes, I'm a Christian. Well, the leader at that point said, take her out and kill her, which is what she expected they were going to say. So the, the, they get hold of her and take her in an automobile. And during the time she's going, she sees people along, all along the sides of the road, dead bodies, face down, dead bodies, all the way as she went. They finally got to their destination. They took cords and tied her hands behind her. They put a blindfold over her. She had seen that there were seven or eight soldiers with rifles there. And they put the blindfold around her, her eyes and, and put her against a wall, stood her up with the, with the arms fastened behind her. And she heard them count one, 
two, and on the count of three, all the rifles shot. Wah! They all shot at her at once. She fell to the ground. When she fell to the ground, the, the arm, the bonds on her arm loosened automatically, and she could kind of get loose and took off the blinders. She was thinking to herself, is this what it feels like to die? And she, she looked down at her body, and she didn't have any blood anywhere. She didn't feel any pain anywhere. And, and the, the soldiers that had just shot her, the firing squad, they were standing there stunned because they all had aimed right at her, all seven or eight of them, and there she was standing without one single bullet wound at all anywhere on her body. They were shocked. They couldn't figure out what, what this never happened before. Everybody else died immediately. But there she was standing. So then they get mad at her. Why didn't you die? What's the matter with you? Why didn't you die? Well, and they took her back to headquarters, started interrogating her, interrogating her some more. Why don't you die? What's the matter with you? And she, she confessed. She said, because Jesus has taken care of me. You know, she, she got bold about it once she made a decision. And they decided, well, there's, we, can't, we can't kill her. We've already tried that. So we're going to assign her to hard labor. Now, at this point, Nora was nine and a half, uh, eight and a half months pregnant. She was eight and a half months pregnant. They send her out to a place where there's a, a mountain. She has to climb the mountain. They put a bamboo pole on her, uh, across her shoulders with a basket on both sides. And the baskets are filled up with coal, coal. And they're about 130 pounds once they load them onto her. And she would have to climb up that mountain she describes her shoes as being like boards with, with, you know, rags wrapped around them, which quickly disintegrated. So she didn't even have any shoes then. They wouldn't, they wouldn't allow them to wear, wear gloves. They wouldn't allow them to wear hats. It was over 100 degrees in the summertime, and so she, her skin got all burnt. And, and if she ever asked for water, they would throw hot water in her face, which just made everything worse than it was before. And, and if, you, if you didn't move as quickly as they thought you should, then they would get out a long whip and whip you. And she con continued carrying these heavy loads down, putting them in the, the truck that was waiting, dumping the coal out, climbing back up the mountain again, and making these trips all day, every day, making these trips. You couldn't have any water. You couldn't have any food. You couldn't have any rest all day long, making these long trips down the mountain. And with all, of, with all of this going on, the heat, the exhaustion, the weight, and now she's eight and a half months pregnant, and she saw women that would fall. They just, they just fell under the weight of the coal. They fell under the exhaustion, no food, no water, too hot, and they fell. And if anybody passed out, what they would do is just take, their, take them limp. Whether they were alive or dead, they didn't care. They'd take them, they'd carry them over to a communal uh, Pile, a pile of people, dead, dead or alive, they'd cover them up with dirt and just bury them, just bury them dead or alive. They didn't care. And so she determined she was such a fighter. Nora was such a fighter. She determined that she was not going to fall, that she was going to endure whatever it was, that she wasn't going to let her baby die, and she wasn't going to die, and she wasn't going to fall. And, and she was, she'd be an ideal Carol, coal carrier, I guess you'd say, because she, she was determined not to let them get the best of her. And she continued doing this day after day, week after week. And, and they had a rule in the communist government that a, a woman that was delivering her baby would have 56 days of leave that they could take off from their work. And so she started a, a, appealing to the local authorities and saying, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm getting ready to have my baby and my husband's in Hong Kong. He's there seeing his ill father. And I need to go to Hong Kong. And, and I, I, sh I, ha I should have 56 days off. That's what you give women. And so I want you to give me permission to go to Hong Kong to be with my husband and have my baby there with my husband. Well, they wouldn't let Nora go because they knew if she joined her husband, she's never going to come back, you know. And so she was assurance to get him to come back to China. So they weren't going to let her go. So this went on, and, and she, meanwhile, she's praying and asking God to get her out of this and to get her family out of this, and, and, and God assures her at one point that she will have the, that it's a baby boy and that she will have the baby in Hong Kong. So that assurance she had in her heart. So all the, the work she continued to do, 
June, June, May went by. June went by. July went by. Now this is the month of August, and she's now 12 months pregnant. Can you imagine? It sounds like she's approaching an elephant due date or something. But she was, she was 12 months pregnant, and she was continuing to do this heavy labor every single day of her life. Well, the local authorities, they wouldn't budge. They wouldn't let her go. They wouldn't do anything to help her at all. So Nora, you know, I told you she was aggressive. She starts sending telegrams every day to the central office, and they called it Peking then. We call it Beijing now. She would send it to Peking to the central office. Every day she would send a telegram, let me have my 56 days off. I deserve this. This is you. Communism has promised a woman to have 56 days off. I want my time off to go to Hong Kong and have my baby with my, with my husband. And every day she would pester them with telegrams, every day, every day. So one day the Lord spoke to her and he said, he said, you need to, they're going to let you go. You need to immediately get ready to leave. You need to get ready to leave immediately. So she goes immediately to the office where you can get airline tickets and she books a ticket for the next day, which was the soonest flight she could get out. She didn't have permission to go yet, but God told her. So she went out and booked the airline tickets. And so then the Lord said, go immediately to the police, the headquarters of the police. Those were the people that wouldn't let her go and wouldn't let her go. So she goes to the headquarters of the police and she said, you know, my, I need my exit paper. I need my permission to go. And the man is furious with her because now not only has she pestered him, she has called his superiors and now his superiors have told him that he has to let her go. So he throws down the papers on the floor. He's so disgusted with her. And he says, usually we go to all extremes to be sure that, no, that nobody escapes, that they all come back to China. But he says, in your case, we don't want you back. Never come back. He throws the paperwork at her. So she takes it, and the next day she leaves. Now, so she goes to Hong Kong, and she's with her husband. She, just like God told her, she had her baby boy in Hong Kong. And then an interesting thing happens. She, meets, she, has a, she has a dream one night that she is preaching to all these white-faced Caucasian people with blue eyes and green eyes, and, and that she's preaching to them. Well, she's never done anything like that in her life. She couldn't imagine how that could ever be so, but that was the, that was the dream that she had one night. Not long after that, she meets a woman named Catherine Kuhlman, who... A lot of you know who Catherine Kuhlman is. She's a very famous evangelist that ended up with worldwide fame because God did so many miracles in, the, in her meetings, spontaneous healings in her meetings. Well, Nora met Catherine Kuhlman, and Catherine Kuhlman felt like God wanted to bring Nora Lamb to America. So she brings Nora Lamb to America and introduces her to a lot of important people, and Nora Lamb ends up being a powerful evangelist all over America as well as other countries. Uh, one time, the, the story goes that she had, she had a very expensive ring that had been given to her by her husband, and she had such a heart for people and a heart for children, and she wanted to help everybody that she possibly could. So she took this ring, and she put it in an envelope, and she mailed it to an orphanage in Taiwan and told them to build a swimming pool. Now, does this sound ridiculous to take a very expensive ring and, first of all, put it in an envelope to mail it, and secondly, ask the orphanage to build a swimming pool with it? You know they're bound to have had other needs besides a swimming pool. But that's why she sent it, and that's what she asked them to do with it. So that's what they did. They built a swimming pool for the orphans, and they taught all of them how to swim. Well, after that, a, a horrendous typhoon came in and it flooded the whole area really, really bad and so many people died. But the orphans, they didn't die because she had had the pool and they had learned how to swim and they didn't drown, they could swim. And so she saved the life of a lot of orphans, not knowing what was going to happen in the future, but being, being led by the Spirit to send this ring and form the swimming pool. That's the kind of life that the woman had. I remember another time she was going to have a big crusade in Taiwan and Laura, Nora would just launch out doing really large things with no idea of how she was going to have the financing for them. She would just trust God. 
like so many of the other people I told you in these glory stories. They would just simply trust God to bring it about. If God said to do it, you just go do it and, and you trust God to provide the finances for it. So that's what she did. So she rented a big coliseum and got all whatever she needed for, for this big meeting that God told her to have in Taiwan. And she was on a program of some sort and they asked her about the meeting she was getting ready to have, the big revival meeting, and she said she needed $300,000 to have this meeting. <laughs> she didn't have any of it, but she needed $300,000, and that's what she said over the air. And amazingly enough, a Buddhist man heard that she needed $300,000 for this Christian revival crusade, and so he, he gave her, the th a Buddhist man gave her $300,000 for the Christian crusade, which shows you that God can use anybody at any time to do anything if we trust him and rely on him. You know, I told you that Nora had been caught in the cultural revolution when she was 17 years of age. Now I'm gonna share another story of another Chinese woman that got caught in the cultural revolution. You probably never heard of her. Her Chinese name, I won't even tell you her Chinese name, but her American name that was given to her was Doreen. I was traveling once with Ruth Heflin and a couple of other ladies, Ruth Ward Heflin, a couple of other ladies, and we were, we were in the western part of China in a town called Xi'an, Xi'an, China. And it's a, it's a walled city, like Jerusalem was, an, was, or is a walled city, or was. Old Jerusalem was a walled city. So was Xi'an in, in the old times, a walled city. You may have heard of the terracotta soldiers. Those are at Xi'an. So people go there these days. But when we went there, there weren't many people going there. So it was a walled city, as I said. And so they have steps going up to the top of the wall in Xi'an. And so we traveled, we walked up the steps to the top of the wall. And up there, I was taking pictures, looking over the wall. And one of the other women with me, was looking at jewelry and looking at uh, the things for sale up there on the top of the wall. There's Chinese people up there selling things. So she was looking at all the curios and things they were selling, and she got into a conversation with this woman named Doreen that I'm going to tell you about. When she found out that Doreen's father was a doctor, she said, oh, w one of the ladies with us is a doctor. She said, I'll, I'll take you over and meet Dr. Vaughn. So she brought Doreen over to me, and we started a conversation. And not only was her, do her, her father a doctor, one of her brothers was a doctor, her sister-in-law was a doctor, her mother was a pharmacist, so everybody in the family had a medical degree, a medical education of some sort, but Doreen. And Doreen was caught in the Cultural Revolution when she was eight, maybe eight or nine years old, and they took her away from her family to indoctrinate her, to train her in the way of peasants. They took her away from her family and sent her to the countryside where she lived with peasant family there in the countryside in a one room, uh, what do you call it, a mud, I guess a mud, a little hut, a little mud hut. In this mud hut there was one bed for everybody in the whole family, a mud bed and it was made out of hardened mud they put a little straw mat on top of it. They had one stove, one round stove that you'd feed with wood, you know, or, or coal, and to heat it up in the winter. And the heat from the stove would go in underneath the bed, the mud bed, and heat the mud bed so they wouldn't freeze to death in the winter time. And of course, she worked out in the fields with all the peasants, and so they were retraining her in the life of a peasant. Things were extremely meager there, hard work, long days, hardly any sustenance, and that's what happened to her. her. Her education, she was a very bright woman, but her education was just stopped at that point in time, like at the third grade or so. When she was old enough, at about age 15, I think, she joined the army, the communist army. She didn't know Jesus. She didn't know God. She's now part of the communist army, young woman, military now, and they, would, they had rough treatment too. She talks about having to stand up to eat your meal, and the only meal that you had was, uh, well, we would call it something like pickles, pickled, pickled vegetables, I guess you'd say, and probably some hot tea. 
and that's what you'd have to eat. And so she learned in the military, she learned something about nursing and became a military nurse. Uh, when she got out of the military, she went to work for her father, who was a pediatrician. But it was a, like a sidewalk, a sidewalk. I, I can't even hardly explain it to you. It's not like a medical facility that we would think of. It's like a, a sidewalk, walk-in, one-room place where he, where he would examine the baby. He was a pediatrician, examine the baby. Sometimes they would give him IV. And the pharmacist, his wife was next door. They sometimes would give him things made out of roots and shoots and rhinoceros horns and whatever, you know, things along those lines to, for treatment. And that was the medical clinic where Doreen worked. But then something fell into her heart to really learn English. Why? I don't know. No reason. She, she had no reason. She's working in a clinic that's 100% Mandarin. They all speak Mandarin. Why would she want to learn English? But it was just a, a desire, a strong desire in her heart. So she starts by herself studying English with no English speaking people around. She would read, you know, read to the best she could with, with no training, no teacher. She would watch television programs or anything she could get her hands on, English, Mandarin translation, dictionaries or whatever she could get her hands on. And she decided in order for her to really learn English, she really needed to stop being a nurse in her father's clinic, and she wanted to go work on the wall in Xi'an so that when tourists came through, she could speak English with the tourists and sell little whatever trinkets or whatever and learn to converse in English. That's why she was on the wall in Xi'an. She would ride her bicycle from her house to the wall of Xi'an every day, she would pick up her bicycle and walk up the stairs to the top of that wall, which was a substantial hike with the bicycle in hand, simply because she wanted to learn how to speak English. So, so I, I had someone take a picture of Doreen and I, and I told her, I'll send you a picture of us together. She said, and later on she told me, she said, a lot of tourists told me that they would send me a picture, but nobody ever sent me a picture. Well, you know, if I say I'm going to do something, I'll do it. So I had her address, so I sent, that, I sent her that picture from America. And then I said, next time I come back to China, and I was going to China a lot back then because I was building Glory Eye Center in Beijing and teaching the doctors and doing a lot of free surgery on poor people. And I was making, you know, several trips a year to China. So I said, next time I come back to China, I'll, I'll be in touch with you and we can get back together again. So I, I did what I said, and I, I told her when I was coming back, and we got together again. Now, this was, this was an awesome thing for me, because between the time I had last seen her and the next time I saw her, she had, her English had improved. I mean, it, had, it was just like, how can anybody learn English this fast and this well with nobody around her to teach her this? But she just was the kind of person that was determined, like Nora. Nora was determined like that, too. And, and, and she, she told me this once. She says, I'm Chinese. I can bear. She didn't know how to say bear it. Or, you know, in other words, I'm, I'm Chinese. I'm strong. I can, I can withstand a lot. That's what she was saying. I can, I can take a lot of pressure. I can stand up under a lot of pressure. So not only did she start learning English, but she started learning ophthalmology terminology. Oh, my goodness. Th I mean, this is hard for Americans. These long words, even ophthalmology. I mean, can you even spell it or say it as, a, as an American or an English-speaking person? They're hard words in medicine. You know, they're out of Latin derivations and stuff. She started learning ophthalmology. And so I was, I was so impressed with Doreen. And as I was building Glory Eye Center, you know, it, I, I realized I was going to need Chinese people that were actually Chinese, and I needed to bring them to America and train them to learn things about ophthalmology. And so I, I asked Doreen, I, I set up a time to call her long distance on the phone, which her family thought that she was crazy because nobody would ever call Doreen in China on the phone. But I called Doreen, and I asked her, I said, would you like to come to America and learn to be a, a nurse for me? Well, of course she wants to come. They all want to come to America. It, it's impossible to even get a visa to come to America. But that's a dream. It's a dream beyond all dreams. 
So she, she said, yes, I, I would love to do that. And so she would travel from far western China where she lived to Beijing to try to get a visa. They wouldn't give her a visa. She, they'd say, go home, get your birth certificate, get your, get your marriage certificate. Go get, they'd tell her to do all kinds of whatever, anything they could think of. And she'd travel, she'd travel like all day long, like sometimes 24 hours standing up in a train one way to get back to her home. And she'd get all the stuff they told her. She'd all travel back another 24 hours standing up in the train and bring it all to them. They'd say, no, no, we, you, we, you still have to do. Anyway, they wouldn't give her a visa. So the next time I came to China, I said, Doreen, I'm taking you to the American embassy, and you will get a visa. God will make a way where there seems no way. God will give you a visa. She thought there's no way. There's no, because she tried all she could. So I took her to the, the American embassy next time I was there, and I saw God do a miracle and give that woman a visa. I brought her to America. I trained her as my scrub nurse, my personal nurse in, in my personal office in America. And I tell you, she was so diligent in every single thing. I never had a better scrub nurse than Doreen. I never had a better nurse than Doreen. She learned all the terminology. She learned everything perfectly. If there was anything she was going to do, she was going to do it impeccably, perfectly. I, I just, I wish I had a, had a whole office full of people just like Doreen. One day, though, she, you know, she was still working on English, and she wanted to learn English idioms. So one day she, she noticed that the other nurses would go to call in a patient and the nurse would say, come on in, you know, come on in. To, they were inviting them to come to the back part of the office. So Doreen was trying to be real American. So she goes there, she gets the chart and she says to the person, she says, come in on, come in on. And of course that, that means nothing. Come in on means nothing in, in English. It doesn't make sense. But she was saying the words backwards, but she was trying to say them in the right order. So we had a lot of laughs out of the way that, that she would say things and do things. But she was a phenomenal person. I just wanted to share with you some of the horrors that people lived in, through in the Cultural Revolution. But they came, out, they came out because of the name of Jesus, because of the glory of God. And I forgot to tell you, Doreen got saved. She accepted Jesus as her Savior. She got to bring her son to America. He got a college education, and now he has a fantastic job, fantastic family. This is all because of the love of God and the grace of God. And that's still love, that same love and that same grace is available to every single one of you if you will give your life to Jesus like Doreen did and serve him with your whole heart. It's available for anyone out there. So I encourage you today to take that step. You can do it at home by yourself. Jesus will embrace you. He'll love you all the days of your life. In Jesus' name. We hope that you enjoyed these stories of the glory of God. We believe that each story we tell will help build your faith and help to bring a miracle into your life. For more information about this program and Dr. Elizabeth Vaughn, visit her website at godsinstrument.com, her YouTube channel at Glory Stories Now, or write her at Elizabeth Vaughn Ministries Incorporated, P.O. Box 454 Argyle, Texas, 76226, USA.